first of all, thank you, Alessandro, for this invitation. It's really nice to be here, actually. And uh, yes, I will just try to give you a really short overview because you're mostly familiar with the virus which we are working with, which is a hepatitis C virus, but just a few uh, um, important features for our work and, uh, and then an introduction to the stress response. And uh, hepatitis C virus is then a, a positive signal strand as RNA virus. Uh, it has a genome which harbors a, an internal ribosome entry site, and that allows the translation of a unique polyprotein that will be processed in three structural proteins that shape uh, the architecture of the virus, and seven non-structural uh, protein important for viral replication and uh, virus assembly. Uh, and this virus is actually really interesting because uh, infection reinduces, like most of the flaviviruses, uh, this reorganization of the ER membrane or with these convoluted membranes where replication uh, takes place through double-stranded RNA uh, intermediates. And the one unique feature of uh, hepatitis C virus is actually that it's hijacking the uh, very low uh, density lipoprotein pathway for its assembly and bedding. Now, just a few words on the clinical relevance, actually. It's still 3% uh, people infected worldwide, and it's uh, really a prime concern of human health and still a, a leading cause of mortality. And uh, uh, if 20% uh, of the infected people clear the virus spontaneously, there are almost 80% of the uh, infected people that will have a progression to chronic hepatitis, and over decades, uh, this uh, hepatitis will progress to liver cirrhosis and ultimately to liver cancer. And uh, despite uh, the, the appearance of the emergence of these new uh, direct acting antivirals, which really uh, substantially increased the success rate of uh, the therapy, it's still really important to remember that there is a huge part of the population that is infected and that still is not aware to be infected. And uh, mathematical models predict a kind of peak of people with chronic infection in about 10 to 15 years. Um, actually, uh, for this uh, chronic hepatitis, it's still unclear now which are the molecular mechanisms and how what are the determinants that makes uh, an infection to have a positive outcome or a negative outcome? And then the uh, determinants that um, um, are responsible for the establishment of this chronicity are clearly uh, unclear. And if we go back to one level uh, down, just to the cell cellular level, the outcome actually of an infection directly really relies on the establishment of a balance between the viral replication but also the uh, stress, re the, the host response. And if we all agree that usually the host response is mainly actually the host genetics and uh, sometimes the failure of the uh, immune uh, responses, we really underestimated actually what is the role of the stress response in this balance. And this is what we are focusing in our work. And uh, just to remember you that the stress response is really tightly connected to translation and also regulating all the immune response and also inflammatory response. And then what we asked in our work actually was how a chronic infection uh, such as the one uh, induced by hepatitis C virus could actually modulate this balance to allow on one hand viral replication and then viral spread, but also survival of the cell. And to give you a short introduction, I know the topic is pretty known here too, but on the stress response, um, in cells that are happy, uh, happily translating, actually you have uh, messenger RNA that are bound to ribosomes forming these polysomes and are waiting to be translated. Uh, the cap machinery, then uh, the pre-initiation complex uh, will uh, bind to the cap messenger RNA together with uh, uh, AF2 alpha, which is the eukaryotic uh, initiation factor uh, to alpha. And this is the one that binds to the tRNA methionine for initiation of the translation. For the mRNA that are not bound to ribosome, they will follow up the degradation pathway in these called P bodies. Now, under stress condition, what happens is that the cell has four specialized uh, sensors that are able to detect deregulation 
of the vital processes. And uh, these uh, sensors are four kinases that will actually uh, phosphorylate the uh, AF2 alpha. And uh, in this case, there will be a decrease in the concentration of this factor bringing tRNA methionine and then the translation cannot start. And what happens is actually that the polysome disassemble and uh, you have this kind of uh, uh, aggregation of stalled mRNA. These stalled mRNA are aggregating with RNA binding proteins like TIA1, G3BP, HRA in the so-called cytosolic stress granules without membrane. And uh, actually, stress granules are really a, a dynamic structure. Uh, you have uh, mRNA there inside that are either waiting for translation to go back once the stress is relieved and they go directly back to the translation. Some will follow up the uh, uh, degradation pathway since P bodies can bind and attach to uh, stress granules. And you have a lot of protein. I mean, the composition of stress granules is really uh, uh, variable depending on the type of stress that is applied. But you have a lot of protein that is just uh, shuttling in, going out. It's really a transient uh, transit into the stress granules. And just put back actually this slide of 2012 because a new concept of uh, stress granules appeared and that was called uh, these antiviral stress granules. Then upon a virus infection, these stress granules are also formed and uh, they contain actually uh, really important uh, sensors of the viral RNA, such as RIGAI, MDF5. And they were proposed to be kind of a platform of the innate comp component to where through the signaling through this uh, stress granule would allow the activation of the interferon uh, activated genes. And as we were discussing today, it's not clear yet whether this is just a localization of this protein or this is really the place where signaling takes place to activate the interferon pathway. Now, just to give you an overview, because there was a recent really nice uh, review on how much uh, viruses counteract uh, the stress granule and how important it, it is because a lot of stress granule, we induce stress granule in the early hours after infections, but almost all of them are going to uh, um, fight again the stress granule formation and then block them uh, at later time points. And there are many different strategies to interact with uh, between the virus and the stress granule machinery. And uh, you can see you have some viruses that will um, use a strategy to cleave some stress granule component to avoid stress granule formation. That's the case for poliovirus, which proteinase is cleaving G3B3. And then you have uh, some, stress, uh, some, sorry, some viruses that will more work on uh, PKR, which is the kinase sensing uh, viral RNA and uh, phosphorylating AF2 alpha. Just then by blocking and antagonizing PKR, they're gonna block the pathway of stress granule formation. And then you have other viruses which actually uh, recruit uh, a stress granule component. And in 2013, your work was missing, Alessandro, and now we can put TBE on it. Actually, where viruses recruit uh, stress granule proteins on their uh, genome, and your work shows really that can travel this uh, stress granule protein to the replication complex and maybe helping for uh, the regulation of the replication and the translation of the virus. But it's pretty impressive to see uh, the listing of uh, mostly RNA viruses that try to counteract the stress granules. Why is mainly all of them are CAP uh, genomes and they have to escape a translation shutoff? And that can be a main reason. What we asked in our work actually was uh, a bit uh, the same way, is, was to look at uh, a chronic virus, meaning infecting over a long time, and then we decided to look over a longer period of time what happened upon uh, HCV infection. And what we used uh, are uh, human hepatoma cells called uh, HUH7 cells, and we looked over 96 hours. And uh, since these cells are missing, uh, the, uh, are not competent in their immune uh, response, what we did is to add interferon alpha exogenously in the, cult in the culture 24 hours after infection, and then look another 72 hours, and this is what I'm showing you here. What we could see is when you infect cells with HCV, 
usually we have a small fraction of five to 10% of cells showing stress granules, so it is not so much. But when we treat with interferon alpha and we start to look at the stress granules, you can see we have an emergence of stress granule popping up around six to eight hours, and then we're reaching kind of plateau um, with 40 to 50% of the infected cells showing stress granules. Then what we were wondering was whether this amount was uh, actually a fraction that was uh, um, showing the steady state level of the, the response, and uh, we decided to go for live say, uh, imaging. And what we did is actually to engineer a uh, um, stable cell line expressing TIA1, a stress granule marker fused to YFP. It's what you can see here. Then you have this mainly localized in the nucleus and a bit cytosolic. Um, and we infected those cells with a virus that was encoding actually a M cherry uh, fusion protein with one of the non-structural protein uh, NS5A. And here you have an example of infected cells, and the dots you can see here are actually the stress granules, but you can see here we have two infected cells that are not having a stress granule at the period where we took the picture. And what we did was uh, 24 hours after infection, adding interferon alpha, took us something like six hours just to set up everything for the microscope and then start the movie. And what we did was making one Z stack uh, every hour for 72 hours, and this is, uh, Actually, the microscope that you were using at the time was just based on confocal microscopy. And here is one of the resulting movie that I'm going to show you. And for clarity, I'm just going to show you the stress granule marker uh, channel. You will have to believe me when I say only infected cells do stress granule. And then when I put the cells on the microscope, you can see already six hours after interferon, we already had a lot of cells showing stress granules here. And uh, I will ask you to focus actually on these two cells here with me. It will be easier, and now I'm starting the movie. And if you look at the cells, you can see the stress granule appear and disappear to reappear again. And actually, all of uh, the culture, this is going to happen for all infected cells. And then we had uh, great uh, image processors working with us, and they de developed a, a plugin. Uh, to quantify how many cells were having stress granule and how many hours we had peaks of stress. And this is just uh, shown here, uh, the example of two cells. And what you can see is really we have these kinds of uh, peak of stress and then it's uh, release and so on. And what was really interesting is that actually the rhythm of these, what we called oscillation of uh, stress peaks and uh, oscillation of stress granules, was really, uh, um, had a really cell-specific rhythm and not something synchronous. Now, we also analyzed back uh, cells that were not treated with interferon. We were really interested to see that actually they had some phases of stress, but much more uh, longer and only a few peaks over 72 hours. And we calculated what we called stress granule oscillation frequency on 24-hour uh, average. And what you could see, we had really an increase, is what you see here on the graphic, of the oscillation by addition of this interferon alpha. And altogether, actually, um, it was not only what we thought with the IF, 40% of the cells having a stress response, but actually it was 97% of the infected cells showing a stress response at one moment over the 72 um, two hours uh, uh, time lapse. And in absence of interferon, this kind of small fraction was just five to 10 percent cells having stress were actually 40 percent uh, of the infected culture when we looked in live. Now, I'll told you that actually the stress granules are really tightly related to uh, the translation. Uh, and uh, what we wanted to verify was whether in these cycles of uh, appearance and disappearance, we had also uh, a cycle of uh, translation going on and off. And what we did was actually uh, using this clicket chemistry, is we looked for the de novo synthesis of uh, protein by uh, incorporation of uh, amino acids that are uh, fluorescently labeled, and we made an IF on those cells. And actually we have here uh, this fluorescent amino acid that is labeled actually red. Uh, when you block translation with cyclohexamide, you don't have incorporation of these amino acids. And in normal cells, you can see here, 
the ones having no, no stress, no dots here, are incorporating uh, amino acid, then translating, and the ones with dots, actually it's blackout. They're not translating anymore. And then we quantified uh, uh, that, and you really understood that actually these cycles of oscillation were also uh, cycles of the phase with an active and then a stalled phase of translation over time. Now, going to the molecular uh, mechanism, of course, we, we tried to see which of the kinases was responsible for the activation of uh, the stress granule formation. And these four kinases have all have a specificity, then PERC is more uh, responsible for sensing the unprotein, um, unfolded protein response. Uh, PKR is the kinase sensing the viral double-stranded RNA. GNC, G, uh, GCN2 is more responsible to the accumulation of tRNA in case of tamivation, and HRI for oxidative stress. Now, of course, PKR was the candidate of choice, and even more of choice since PKR was the only gene that was interferon-induced. Then um, we concentrated on PKR and just did a simple Western blood analysis, and what we could see is in uh, cells infected with HCV, we had increase of PKR under addition of uh, interferon alpha, but uh, then a huge increase of the amount of uh, phosphorylated PKR, that is the activated form, and phosphorylated AF2 alpha at this level, which brings us to a shutoff of translation. We validated that by a silencing experiment. And then we could see that by silencing PKR actually and measuring the amount of cells making stretch granules, we really had a complete abrogation of cells uh, uh, making stretch granules. And in the other way around, if you expressed uh, stably PKR in the cells to a level that was more, more, uh, more or less the level uh, we obtained under interferon alpha stimulation, we restored actually uh, the amount of cells making stress granule to a level uh, really uh, um, close to the ones of cells treated with interferon. What let us think, okay, interferon has only an effect by inducing the amount of molecule of PKR that can make a better sensing of double-stranded RNA. Interestingly, when we looked at the oscillation of those uh, cells and we uh, made some uh, imaging of uh, PKR over expressing cells, we were interested to see that we could restore uh, an oscillation much more faster than cells that were uh, not treated with interferon, but anyway, not so fast than the uh, cells treated with interferon, although the amount of molecules seemed to be the same. And that started to open uh, us uh, another view, meaning that this is not enough and you certainly need other molecules and other factors to get uh, oscillation frequency as what we see in the, the other mechanism. We actually, I didn't say a word on that, but we did not exclude PERC from our analysis. I'm not showing it here, but if we silence PERC, we still had stress granules. Then in our cells at this time point, PERC and the UPR response were not involved in the stress granules. But we had then the mechanism that is switching on the stress granule, and we were searching for the one switching off the stress granules. And in the literature, what was described was that uh, when you have uh, phosphorylation of F2-alpha by the PERC pathway, then the unfolded uh, protein response, then there is directly a sensing of the amount of uh, um, EF2 uh, alpha that is phosphorylated. And what happens is you have a, a transcription uh, and translation of transcription factors, which, uh, among others, uh, allow the transcription of GAT34. And GAT34 is actually a regulatory subunit of a protein phosphatase, protein phosphatase 1. And altogether, we go back, dephosphorylate AF2 alpha to make a kind of release to the cell just to survive. Um, then what happens when AF2, AF2 alpha is dephosphorylated, the translation can shut on again. And you have a feedback negative regulation on the transcription and on the, uh, tra on the transcription and, and on the translational level of GAD, and the loop is closed, everything is off again. Then we just gave it a try and see whether this could be the component that was 
shutting off the stress granules in the case of HCV infection. And on the transcription level, we had a, a strong induction of GAT34. And this induction was actually more, more or less constant over time, all over the time of the movie. Now, um, since we were struggling really a lot with this protein that we could not detect by a Western blot, we could not silence it, it was really a hard way, we decided to overexpress the um, GAT34. With this way, we were expecting by having more phosphatase active, we should have had more dephosphorylation of AF2 alpha and then less transgranule in uh, HCV infected cells. And this is what we could measure by AF actually. We dropped from 60% here in this case to 20% down uh, stress granules in the infected cells. And actually this brought us to a kind of model that we proposed. Um, and the first thing that we discovered by doing these experiments with GAT34 is actually that you always have a basal level of GAT34 that is always expressed. And if you try to silence it, and that's the reason why we could not manage, this is killing the cells. And if we inhibited uh, GAT34 with a specific uh, um, inhibitor, and what happened in the mock culture was all cells directly had full stress granules. And actually we were just uh, uh, inhibiting the small amount of GAT34 that is uh, needed to keep the cell being, uh, let's say, relaxed and not sensitive to all kind of small stress that can be around. And then in a normal condition, cell homeostasis, then there is a bit of GAD that dephosphorylate AF2 alpha, and then we have no stress granules, and then translation is shut on. In the case of HCV infection in this case, and we had interferon alpha, we have induced the amount of molecules, of PKR molecules that can recognize the double strand RNA. PKR is activated and will phosphorylate AF2 uh, alpha, and the balance goes in the other way around, then translation is off. What happens directly after phosphorylation of AF2 alpha is actually that the amount of GAD is going to be uh, induced and we will have more molecules of GAD34 doing the inverse uh, job, dephosphorylating AF2 alpha, and we shut off the translation on again. And actually, those cycles prevail as long as you, as you have viral double stranded RNA uh, in your cell. And we were really curious, actually, just to see uh, where, whether that was specific for HCV infection or that could be also the case for other viruses. And then we choose some other positive strand and also negative strand of the RNA virus. And we were really surprised to see that actually um, this uh, stress response was a kind of concert to many RNA viruses. However, with uh, stress um, oscillation frequency really unique to each viruses. And what we did was actually to try a transfection of this synthetic double-stranded RNA and just see whether we could get oscillation. And as you see here, we got strong oscillation, meaning that those oscillations actually do not need any viral replication. What is just needed is the trigger, which will activate uh, the cascade. And as long as the cell is able to fight, you will have these cycles of on or off of the uh, stress response. Now, we had the chance that this plugin that was developed for us, I mean, it was not an automatic plugin. We had to click a lot to analyze these movies, but we could uh, extract many more informations of uh, these movies. And I'm just going, maybe uh, if you could switch off. One information that we uh, uh, extracted was actually the influence of the stress on the cell division. And just going to show you now normal cells, uh, non-infected cells, and you can see we measured actually cells that are dividing and we call them sister cells coming from a SEM and they will divide and give a sister sister cell. And actually if we quantified that, it was really amazing to see how precise in time was where this division happening is really synchronized. And one mother cells divide in two and those ones will more, more or less always divide in a perfect uh, rhythm. Now what happens with HCV infected cells, it's gonna, the movie that I'm gonna show you is actually, you will follow here, it's dividing, we don't see it at the start, still happily, and this one makes stress. The other ones continue to divide, but this one is not dividing anymore. 
And this is an example of one that we measure. Then you have a cell that is infected. Does not, uh, this one is not having stress and dividing. The one having stress cannot divide anymore. And we estimated that you need kind of a 10 hours uh, recovery phase before being able to uh, divide again. And that makes sense because this, the cell has to recover to get enough material to be able to divide. But uh, where it was really interesting actually is that uh, when we quantified it a bit more statistically, we could see that uh, in normal cells, over 72 hours, you will have an average two to three division over three days. In the cells infected with HCV and interferon, which are oscillating so uh, uh, fast, actually 80% are not dividing and a few ones are dividing once over the 72 hours. You really have a kind of block of uh, cell division. And we took advantage of these cells that we could see in absence of interferon. I said to you we had at the end 40% that had these slow oscillations and then 60 of those ones that were not oscillating. And what we could see is actually for the ones uh, that had these uh, stress granules, they had a bit of uh, division, mainly one division, but also two and three times per 72 hours. But the ones having the stress granules had really, again, a, a block in the cell division, showing us a bit that these oscillation control really uh, the cell division rhythm. And we could correlate that actually to the cell deaths of the cells, and there we were really uh, surprised because we were expecting that a cell that is really stressed should die faster than a one that is not stressed. And this is clearly not what happened. What we could see is actually in uh, cells having no stress granule infected, we had something like 60% cell deaths over three days. But the one that had a high oscillation had a really uh, prolonged survival. And here we went bound, down to something like 30%, uh, half of the half-life uh, was gained. And that changed a bit of view of uh, this uh, stress response to HCV, saying that if we had infected cells that were not dying, actually, that could serve as kind of reservoir, and that maybe by finding this balance between uh, um, the stress response and the replication level, the virus could exploit that to uh, establish persistence since the cells were not being feared. Now, um, and this was the, the end of the work that I did then uh, now already two years ago. And in between, as Alessandro uh, said, um, starting my own group, uh, did not think to go on with this subject, but actually it opened many ways <laughs> of uh, continuing the research. And we had many questions staying, standing after this project. And the first question was actually, how is that all possible? How, I mean, there are many parameters that should influence the stress response that we cannot address experimentally. It's going to be hard to answer to questions like, what is the role of the membrane rearrangement in this stress response? Or uh, we had viruses with different freq uh, oscillation frequency, but also different uh, replication strategy. We had positive strand RNA viruses, uh, protected in this membrane uh, foci where replication takes place, and then where we expect not so much double-stranded RNA to get out. And then we had viruses like Sendai virus, where you say you have a negative strand virus that has really a low amount of double-stranded RNA that is produced, actually hardly to be detectable, but inducing a really strong uh, uh, oscillation, stress granule oscillation. And as I showed to you for the PKR cell, somehow it's not enough to overexpress only one proteins to get the same oscillation level. It seems that many other components should be involved. And now just from my perspective, um, just to go back to the scheme of the start, actually, when we started, we thought, okay, infection is a kind of relying between the host response and the viral replication. Um, and we entered in a new world, actually, by saying the case of HCV, actually, this balance is uh, uh, defining persistence in a sense, because uh, the level of viral replication and the level of the host response made the cells uh, survive longer. And that's the reason now we are really interested to go on with that and understand what is the role of the oscillation directly on persistence. 
And what was interesting, and the reason why I show you the, these uh, cell division, is that when we think back to hepatocytes, actually hepatocytes are quiescent, and they're not dividing. And what we are looking now is uh, into a model that is um, a cell culture model that is more relevant for hepatitis C infection, and not looking at four days, but looking at two weeks to see whether this uh, stress response is also, first of all, oscillating or um, different uh, in the case of Kyensen cells. And when we have also another part that is still in interesting us, and uh, this is actually for all of the other viruses to understand uh, not only how this oscillation actually are regulating the stress response, but also the host immune response. Because I said to you, uh, if we have a regulation of the translation, we also have a regulation of the translation of immune factor. And our idea is a kind of saying, if we have sequestration of this transcript of the immune response, we will have a delay in the immune response and then a possibility for the virus to spread faster. And this is what we are trying to do, kind of analyzing the immune response with the oscillation and then the virus spread to another level. And with that, I'm already coming to the end of my talk, but I have to say that that was really a work of a lot of people together that would not have been possible anyway. And the first uh, lab that I want to uh, thank is actually uh, Ralf Barton Schlager's lab in which I did my postdoc and the people that was also working in this, uh, on this project. But I had great collaborators, uh, people of the stress granule world without whom I couldn't have done uh, many analyses that the uh, Georg Stuckin lab, also a few comments, nice comments of Nancy and uh, material from the Samuels lab. And this is the bench of people with whom we could not analyze any kind of imaging and those are my image processor. Uh, and uh, we have uh, people of the screening facility uh, and now uh, the mathematical modelers. And now here are a few people that are coming to the bench and hopefully uh, helping this project to uh, go forward. And then thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions.